Okay, good morning. Good morning, everybody. We are here now to get into the investigation of mysteries with uh, somebody who has done this for, the, for his own life. And uh, well, to introduce him, he doesn't need really an introduction, as you know, but for those of you who maybe came from Mars, <laughs> here is the James Randi you all know. Do it at this volume. It's got to be heard. Yes. Can we stop the tape? Can we raise the, the, voice, the volume? Yes. Okay. Rather consider, but please. Amazing. <laughs> it is. Yes. Tell me if it is uh, louder now, somebody. Hello. <laughs> you can hear Randy, but uh, people here are not very clear. I'm not very clear? You are very clear. clear. Thank you. No, because I don't have the microphone. I was asking if, if the audio of the, the video can be made louder. I, I think they did, they did in the time that they did. They did? OK. So we're. It's okay, let's forget it. Okay. about dice. It's a strange thing, but a die, you know, is supposed to have, a, it has two on this side, and it has four on that side. Now, that's not the way it's supposed to be made. See, the four on that side and the two on that side, actually, it's supposed to be a five on that side, but it's not. This is not made properly. <laughs> two on that side, four on that side, two on that side, and five on that side. How'd you do that? show you how easily a skilled magician can reproduce any of these so-called psychic tricks. Hi, I'm James Randi. I'm a magician. That is to say, I'm a fake. Watch this. I'm going to do a little trick for you. I'm going to bounce this pen on the edge of the table. Now I'll look away so you're sure I'm not blowing, but I want you to look right into your TV set, concentrate on it, make that pen fall off the table. Let's work on it now. Come on, concentrate. Stronger. Gee, that was very good. How did you do that? June 7th, we'll be offering $100,000 prize to anyone who can prove psychic we powers can do it. on our program. You're thinking of a pizza, right? No. Uh, a small little rodent? Maybe a hat? A hat? No. Uh, a clothespin? No. Uh, wrong. Uh, uh, a shoe? Uh, gesundheit. Oh, oh, I may have a hammer. No. We're gonna get that money. We're gonna make that money. We're gonna make that money. We're gonna get your money, Randy. You're gonna be broke, man. Do you believe everything you see on the news? How about a nationally reported story about a computer that determines the guilt or innocence of suspected criminals? Host James Randi, professional skeptic and a bunker of frauds, takes us through the conception, the setup, and the payoff of these remarkable scams. I'm James Randi, and in this special presentation, we'll look at the inner workings of some of history's most outrageous scams and the confidence men behind them. Now, most cons follow a very simple set 
of rules. The first rule is that the con artist always wins. Tonight on Nova, James Randi, magician and investigator of psychic phenomena. Don't laugh, there's a science. For 25 years, Randi has explored the world of the paranormal and tested claims of supernatural powers. Jesus. Now Randy journeys to Russia to challenge psychics never before seen in the West. After decades of research, can we finally discover the secrets of the psychics? Throw them up there on the stage. You don't have to leave with those pills. He had people who were on Throw medication, necessary Go medication, like nitroglycerin tablets for Ooh. heart attack, digitalis, things like oral insulin. He had them come out of the audience and throw their pills up on stage. Throw them up there. That's a blow of defeat for the devil. That's As you see it, this the is the real danger in all the faith healing. Jesus. It's one of the real dangers. The other danger is emotional dependence on charlatans like this, people who claim that they have an ability to tell you how to run your life and how to recover from disease. Somebody praise him! This week, Horizon is doing something completely different. For the first time, we are conducting our own experiment. We are testing a form of medicine which could transform the world. Should the results be positive, this man will have to give us one million dollars. Do the tests, prove that it works, and win a million dollars. Can psychics really sense what you can't can the stars predict your future? And thousands of nurses... <laughs> For some reason. Let's discontinue this. There's no point. <laughs> That's yes. okay. Oh, we can. Well... Don't do anything about it. All right, well, we can do, well, James Rand, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. What comes up next? I'll ask you. So how many of you have seen uh, Randy's movie, An Honest Liar? Oh. Well, <laughs> yes, that's good. So I guess that uh, you're all familiar with the Peter Popov story with the, the Alpha Project, the Carlos hoax, and all the, the amazing investigations that he has done. But we have a few little thoughts and, uh, and maybe a few things to see that could be new to you as well if you've seen and if you have followed Randy's career. It's going to be a nice day after all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing that I would like to ask you, and you can tell this audience, is uh, about investigating mysteries, which is what most of us here are doing. What is your first suggestion to anybody who would like to investigate mysteries? I think you have to back down in your thinking to a certain extent. You have to come to ground zero, the lowest level perhaps you can come to in your thinking process and start to think from that point up. Don't start here or here. Start at ground zero. Have no previous impressions of the so-called psychics and such. Start from the very beginning and look and at them and ask this simple question. Is this rational? Is this logical? Is this probably going to be true? You've got to have that attitude. You've got to be skeptical. We've all used this word many, many times, skeptic and skeptical, but some of us tend to take a step up. I'll believe them for this moment to see whether or not there might be some truth in it, but you must be skeptical from the absolute ground zero. Absolutely, and, when, and as Sherlock Holmes would say, never go into an investigation with a preconceived explanation of what the solution could be because Otherwise, you bring your own. And that was own. said by Arthur Conan Doyle, who was one of the most illogical writers in history. The Sherlock Holmes could not have existed. 
he would walk into a, into a deserted warehouse and find a small piece of tobacco ash on the, the ground, pick it up and say, Watson, this is from a Trinicoli cigar. I recognize it because I've done a great study of cigar ashes. Duh. <laughs> and obviously this means that the man here was very wealthy. Now the fact that somebody might have picked it up off the street and taken it in there and smoked it didn't occur to Sherlock. No, he had to have this immediate solution and he was wrong, but don't fall for that sort of thinking. Yeah, but the stories were fun anyway. Uh, it's Conan Doyle actually who was quite a believer oh, yes, in the Conan supernatural. Doyle. Oh yes, absolutely. And you had a chance to, uh, to have a, let's say an exchange of letters with oh, yes. the protagonist of one of the most famous hoaxes in history, which is the Cottingley Fairies. Would you like to tell us oh, the, the story? The Cottingley Fairies, yes. Uh, they weren't real. <laughs> oh, this may be a great surprise and a shock to you, but they were not real. And the fact that, that this man supported these two little girls who went out into the woods and said they had seen fairies and taken pictures of them, the pictures themselves are so obviously cutouts of paper. There's no question of it. And any person who looks at them and says, wait a minute, that's the person you want to talk to. The person who doubts it from the very, very beginning. That two little girls found fairies in the woods. Of course, in those days, I'm afraid that Great Britain did believe in a lot of fairies. And I don't want to get into the details, but it would bring in the royal family and a few other people. And I, uh, I, I hesitate to do that. They're embarrassed enough from time to time. Well, but this story took place in the 1920s when photography was still young, so it, maybe, oh, yeah. well, it could be understandable that uh, trickery could not be that immediate. But however, 60 years later, one of the little girls had an exchange of letters with you. Yes, Elsie wrote to me. Elsie was one of the girls. And uh, she wrote to me, and she almost, in her letters, would almost admit it. She would almost say it. But the sentence always dribbled off and never amounted to anything. And I never got a letter from Elsie where she said, which she eventually did say, that it was simply a trick, cutouts stuck into the grass. She didn't tell me that, but she did tell uh, some people in the press eventually, and so it was all revealed. And then England revolted and said, why is she lying now? <laughs> when she tells the truth, they call it lying because they don't want that to be the truth. Very good. Now, for some investigations, you have to be a little bit, uh, how should I say it, um, cunning, um, yes. deceiver, in, in oh, a yes. sort of way, yes. in a very nice sort of way. Thank you. And uh, here is an example of an investigation that you did years ago, and you had to pretend you were not you. What would that be? <laughs> How could I possibly do it? There, there was a, uh, this guy we were going to see now. Uh, his name is Adam Gersin. Ah, oh, yes. If the you, famous Adam If you Gersin. write it down, you would see it's an anagram for James Randi. Yes, it's uh, A-D-A-M-J-E-R-S-I-N. Move it around, and it produces James Randi. A coincidence, of course. So I'll, I'll show the video and then you tell us what, uh, what okay. this was about, if the audio is going to work, of course. And the light, I, don't, I hope I'm not. If we can have any media yes. cooperation, well, let's I see if we can try it this time. Strange looking person. All right, Adam. You want to shuffle the cards? Looks like the werewolf. And make four pipes. He's a very bad at shuffling cards, obviously. And I thought you were a magician. But you're a very successful man. And that you're very powerful. 
prosperous man. You're prosperous in what you wanted to do. And in certain things, you're even more successful than you planned. So your future looks good also. And so you're doing well, all right? Thank you. And God bless you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what was happening here? This was a, a, a cold reader, well, let's say, this was a psychic reader. Yes, that was a fortune teller. We uh, disguised me somewhat. I hope you didn't recognize me. <laughs> and uh, This was uh, not your real hair, was it? Oh, no, that was not my real hair. I never had hair like that except when I was about this old. But uh, yes, that was false hair. Could you believe that deception? <laughs> and we went into the fortune teller's parlor, and she accepted me and told me a whole fortune which had no semblance of reality whatsoever. And um, we were just proving a case that we can go in with a simple wig on and a bit of makeup and a, and a bad back, as you see, and we could fool any of these people the same way they were fooling us. So one fake fooling another fake, an interesting combination. I also remember another experiment that you did in England for a series called Psychic Investigator. Remember that one? Oh, yes. And you had uh, another reader uh, doing a reading for uh, some, say, subjects. And you recorded the whole thing. And then in the end, the subject said, well, but she guessed immediately the name of my uncle or whatever, which was Harold. And you said, well, you know, we printed the whole thing that she said, and she had 47 names before she got to Harold. Yes. But he, he had forgotten it, right? Forgets all about the rest of the names. But 47 names to finally come to the name Harold. And she claimed victory. She said, there, I knew. <laughs> yes, after 47 names were being announced. <laughs> Just lucky. There is another first, uh, of course, um, investigation that you all uh, know very well, uh, which is of a certain character bending cutlery for his own enjoyment, I think. But we're not going into that. We are going into a specific episode that involved uh, Randy and, uh, and a presenter of a Canadian TV program. I think it was called ESP, was it? Yes. Okay. His name is Alan Spraggett. And this is a very uh, rare video because it was lost and uh, we found a copy of it. It's in Italian, but there are subtitles in English. And it's the only existing copies, but it's very important because I will show you what is happening and then Randy maybe will tell you what really happened. This is the premise. Randy was invited by Alan Spraggett to go on his show. Alan Spraggett was this journalist who really believed in gathering, was very convinced and could not really accept the idea that Randy could replicate, right? And incidentally, this was the day of black and white television. You older folks may remember that. Yes, long time ago. It's only black and white television, so. So he invited you, uh, but you suspected, uh, um, let's say, it was not, not going to be that clear. And so you said, I'm not going to perform because I know that conditions would be very different from those that you gave to Yuri Geller. So uh, probably I wouldn't be able to do anything. Oh, don't worry, he said, right? Oh, yes. You just come uh, and you, we talk. We just talk. Yes. And this is what happens instead. Suddenly, this presenter takes out two spoons. Randy si è spinto anche più in là. Ha voluto dimostrare che anche persone competenti in trucchi possono essere vittime di inganni e lo ha dimostrato nel corso di un programma televisivo in Canada. Questo signore è Alan Spraggett, parapsicologo convinto, autore di libri e anche esperto in trucchi. E gli aveva invitato James Randy alla sua trasmissione proprio per dimostrare che Randy in realtà non era capace di fare le cose che Uri Geller faceva. Estrasse due cucchiai che aveva portato egli stesso da casa, due cucchiai antichi da collezione, e chiese a Randy di piegarli strafinandoli semplicemente alla maniera di Geller. Doveva essere questa la dimostrazione che Randy non avrebbe mai potuto fare una cosa del genere in quelle condizioni. Ecco invece cosa accadde. Yeah. 
Now, these are teaspoons that Spraggett himself supplied. Spraggett impallidì. La sua sperata dimostrazione si ritorceva proprio contro di lui. Diventava cioè la dimostrazione lampante che Randy, messo nelle stesse condizioni di Geller, poteva fare le stesse cose. Spraggett sfidò Randy a indovinare il disegno che lui stesso aveva fatto a casa e poi chiuso nella busta senza farlo vedere a nessuno. Affermò che Geller era riuscito a indovinare il disegno tenendo semplicemente la busta tra le mani per 10 secondi. Randy disse allora, va bene, mi dia 10 secondi. Questo disegno, è bene notarlo, Spraggett lo aveva custodito fino a quel momento nella tasca interna della giacca. Non solo, ma non aveva neppure detto a Randy che avrebbe dovuto sottoporsi a questo esperimento. Vale a dire che le condizioni erano molto più difficili e il controllo molto più stretto di quello adottato nei confronti di Keller. Proprio per questo Randy, dopo aver chiesto carta e penna, disse «Se riuscissi a indovinare il disegno nella busta, lei direbbe che sono un medium?» «Non lo so, sarei molto impressionato». Ma scusi, lei sostiene che Geller è un medium perché riesce a fare questo. Beh, vediamo se lei sa farlo. No, scusi, lei dice che Geller è un medium perché riesce a farlo. Se io faccio altrettanto, dirà che sono un medium? Dirò che lei mi ha sorpreso. Bene, ora chiudo quello che ho disegnato e lo metto qui. Vuole aprire la busta e dirmi cosa c'è dentro? Certamente. Che cosa c'è? È un battello, un battello a vapore. Con il fumo che va verso destra? Sì. Sono un medium se ho riprodotto il suo disegno? Sì o no? Se l'ha riprodotto lei è straordinario. Ma non sono un medium? È straordinario. Allora sono straordinario. È davvero straordinario. Davvero straordinario. Questo non le prova niente? Right. <laughs> Now, Alan Spraggett flew into a temper when the cameras were off. That was the end of the taping. And he went to the control room and he said, how did that happen? How did that happen? Who cheated? Somewhere, someone cheated. Oh, I had cheated. <laughs> I had arrived an hour and a half before. It was raining heavily outside. And I told the guard at the door, uh, I, I'm going to go and get something to eat. I'm a little hungry. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll just go back and uh, leave a note for Mr. Spraggett. Now, Mr. Spraggett was with Walter B. Gibson at that time, if you know that name at all. Uh, he was in the studio, and I saw that he was recording, so I very carefully went around outside the studio, tried the door, said Alan Spraggett on the door. I opened the door, went inside, saw a briefcase, opened it up, very carefully opened an envelope on the inside, saw what it was, hmm, I see. Closed up again, <laughs> put it back in the briefcase. <laughs> and then I took a spoon that I saw there and bent it back and forth until it was well fractured, you see, and then carefully placed. It was a sterling silver spoon, really beautiful <laughs> item. And I put it back in the suitcase and closed. And I walked outside and I said to the guard, Mr. Spraggett is in the studio and very busy, but uh, if, if he asks, tell him I'll be back in a little while. I've gone to have something to eat. Oh, okay. The guard left, and he went outside because they were changing the guard. Talk about fortunate. I mean, really. They were changing the guard, so the next guard who came in had never met me. He didn't know that I had already been into the studio, And uh, so that was, I walked in and I said, my name is James Randy and I'm supposed to see Mr. What is it, Spraggett, Mr. Spraggett? And uh, he said, oh yes, Mr. Spraggett, 
will be with you in a few minutes. He rang a buzzer, and pretty soon down the hall came Spraggett, not knowing that I'd already been in his office and did all these terrible things. And I met him, and I said, are you Mr. Spraggett? How do you do, sir? And uh, that's the way the miracle took place. And while I sat there, and Spraggett was astonished over what I had done, I looked at the control room, and I saw several of my friends, including Walter B. Gibson, a very uh, well-known writer in the United States. And also Houdini's uh, uh, Houdini's ghost. biographer, yes, as a matter of fact. And Sprague, Sprague was just <laughs> going crazy. And Walter B. Gibson sat there, and he looked at me, and he went <laughs> through the glass. So that was a great victory. But me. you were able to do it because you were you know, you were using what magicians usually use, exactly. which is to be one step ahead of the that's audience. Right, that's you, right. You were already ready before mm -hmm. everything started. And that's because you were a magician. So maybe we could open this window a little and talk a little bit about your magical career. Uh, you were like um, Dini oh, that, that yeah. we mentioned, you know, an escape artist. Well, I broke out of... Uh, quite a number of jails in my day, and had a tremendous collection of handcuffs and all kinds of fetters and strange things like that. Studied them very carefully, and I learned to pick regular locks on doors uh, that very early in my life, very, very early as a child. And uh, it was not looked upon as something that I should be doing, but uh, I did it because I had admired the life of Harry Houdini, of course, though he was dead before I was born, and therefore I never got a chance to meet him. No, it's actually impossible to meet people if they're already dead. <laughs> I, I want to assure you of that. <laughs> and uh, so I, I started by going around to the local jails. Now, I was born in, in Toronto, Canada, and uh, I started going around to the local jails and studying their locks. And uh, what's up there? Ah, yes. And there I am at the grave of Houdini in the McCullough Cemetery uh, in New York State. And uh, I wore the hat because I have respect for people like this. And th this is something, that's a bust of Houdini on the top. And that's his original name, Weiss, there. And uh, that's the seal of the Society of American Magicians on the stone. That bust was subsequently stolen and taken away, but there was a replica of it in a museum in uh, New York, and they replicated it again and put it back on top of the pedestal. But these things have happened and will continue to happen, I'm afraid. And I think there's a replica also near uh, you. Yes, yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you know the name is Penn and Teller? Okay, very, very great enthusiasm here from this young man. Uh, Penn and Teller are two people that I introduced many years uh, before. They had come to hear a lecture by me. And one of them sat on this side of the audience and the other sat on this side. And uh, they knew one another because they were working in the streets. Penn was doing the older and a bigger guy was doing juggling, wonderful club juggling, and Teller was doing a pantomime act uh, dressed as a harlequin. And they, were, they knew one another just to say, hello, good morning, when they worked on the streets of Philadelphia. And uh, so they came to see my little lecture, and uh, I took the two of them afterwards, and I took them to the, the coffee shop, and I sat there and I looked back and forth from one to the other. Like that. And Penn said to me, he said, you're looking at us like we're some sort of specimens. I said, well, I'm thinking of Laurel and Hardy and... Uh, uh, Abbott and Costello. Abbott and Costello, yes. Oh, all, all the comedy teams of, uh, uh, of fame in those days. And I thought, you two are perfectly matched. You're different sizes. One speaks, the other is mute. Uh, you're, you're a natural combination. And they sort of said, yes, well, we talked about it one time. Well, six or eight weeks later, I heard from Penn, and he said, we're opening in a theater in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard. And I knew 
that my encouragement of them had worked. And today they're known as Penn and Teller. They're world famous. They travel around the globe and uh, they've done very well for themselves. And they always remember me. I get letters, I get email all the time and phone calls from them saying what they're doing currently. So this is one of the better things I've done in my life to introduce these two strange characters. As Teller once said to me, he's the small one, Okay, you got it, all right, okay. He doesn't speak, you see, he's a mute. <laughs> okay, thank you. a lot of people didn't get it, but uh, I forgive them. So you, you have performed most of your life as a, as a magician, as an escape artist, oh, but yes. you gave up escapes uh, a long time ago. Yes, that's true. And you, you don't perform her any longer. Well, I, I should give a demonstration, don't you think? You, you think so? I think so, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. I need two gentlemen from the audience who will come up front here and uh, participate with me. Uh, if I can get down off here without falling and breaking my neck. You want to stay here? Oh, yeah, I can stay here. Yeah, you can all see. Well, people on the end there, you stand up. Okay. How do you do, sir? Hi. What is your name? Conrad. I knew that. Would you step <laughs> over there, please? And one more gentleman, please, from the audience. You don't have to hold up your hand. You just, you're not a gentleman. No, no. Not a gentleman, but a fine lady. Yes. How do you do, sir? Hi. Very good. Uh, stand on one side of me here, one of you. That's very good. Okay. And, oh, I forgot to ask you. I'm sorry. Do you have a piece of rope about that long? Either, either one of you? Well, um, <laughs> oh, by a strange and somewhat contrived coincidence, <laughs> I do. It's right here. And uh, this is a good, strong piece of rope. Would you hold on to that end? Both hands. Both hands. That's very good. Same thing. Both hands. Hold on tight. I want you to pull on it and make sure that it doesn't stretch. Very good. Thank you. Are you exhausted? I can see that. <laughs> oh, I'm going to take off this... Uh, cheap wristwatch here and put it away so that I don't damage it. Thank you very much, young man. I know your name, yeah. so. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to ask these gentlemen to tie my hands together behind my back. And when I say that, I want you to really pull very tightly on it, okay? Here, hold on to that end. That's your end again, right there. That's it. And this is your end. Would you hold yes. on to that? Hold on. Both hands. Come on. Both hands. Okay. There. Pull on it now. Come on. <laughs> really? Oh, the pain. <laughs> All right. Now, bring it on, on top. Pull tightly. You're not pulling tightly enough. That's it. Tie a knot on top. On top. Tie a knot. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I want. Don't break the cufflinks. All right. Pull on it now. Come on. Hey, that's it. Good and tight. Put another knot on top of it. Yes, please. Your God has nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he doesn't. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, really heave now, that's it. Is there room for another knot? Yeah. Okay, well, go ahead. All right. Now that's tight. All right, thank you. You right. can let go now. Thank you. Now, I'm going to try to free myself from this very simple tie here. Don't stand quite so tight. <laughs> Uh, you, you can stand a little closer. Oh, the rope seems to have fallen off. A miracle. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You still have it. Yes, I still have it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, now it's to, to let you get your breath back, we're going to see another performance. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. You see before you a steel can. This can is securely welded and riveted together in such a way that it is absolutely airtight and watertight. There's a steel lid that goes along with it and six steel hasps. At the same moment that my head goes beneath the water, I invite you all here in the theater and at home as well, to take a deep breath, as I have done. <laughs> then, 
estimate for yourself at the time that you have to exhale whether or not you could survive this watery tomb. Now, in doing this performance, ladies and gentlemen, I take full credit for the performance only because the invention that you are about to witness, this particular illusion, was invented, designed, conceived in all ways by the greatest escape artist who ever lived, the great, late Harry Houdini. I must tell you perhaps an amusing story. I once did this exact illusion, done that way with that kind of timing and everything. Uh, and I show one of the very first uh, stage and television shows that David Copperfield ever appeared on. And uh, I had met him just previously. And there was another magician named Shimada, very famous in the United States, a Japanese friend of mine, and uh, when I get out of the can, I sit up on top of it. They don't see that, of course, you see. And uh, I, I drain off a little bit so that I'm more presentable when I walk through the curtain. And while I'm sitting there, now there's no top in the curtain, I hear a voice, it was a David Copperfield, who turned to Mr. Shimada and said, you know, Shimada, that doesn't look too difficult to me. And they were standing directly above me, <laughs> about three feet, a meter or so away. I looked up at them. <laughs> I wondered how they had gotten there. And uh, Shimada said, no, I think I'm going to get one of those cans. And maybe I'll do the same trick. Well, let's go. And Copperfield and Shimada walked off, and I just shook my fist like that. And then I walked through the curtain, of course for my finale, but the audience never knew about that. Many years later, I was in, um, I think it was CBS uh, television studio in Los Angeles, and one of the, I was rehearsing on one stage, and uh, 
a prop man came to see me and he said, oh, do you know Shimada? And I said, yes, I do. He said, he's in the next studio. He's setting up his props. Really? <laughs> oh, interesting. So I walked in very quietly and I heard, I was like, what is it? God damn it, there's been in the complaints. And I looked over, I saw the lights on here, and I saw Shimada laying on his back trying to adjust a gigantic dragon that he had built, especially for this show. And he was cursing away, God damn it, carrying on. So I just walked over, and his feet were sticking out here. And I said, you know, that doesn't look too difficult. I think I'll get one of these. <laughs> and I heard Shimada roaring with laughter underneath, and he finally uh, came out. So that was my revenge. Copperfield, I haven't had any revenge on him yet, but maybe next year or the year after, we'll see. So I thought you would like me sharing that story with you. So do you miss not doing those kind of escapes any longer? Yes, I do, but at the age of um, 89, you know, I think uh, it, it would not be uh, quite as effective if I were to try to, and now maybe I'll take a wet sponge or something <laughs> like that and do an escape from that. There is another side to your magic which we just get a little glimpse of, but we, if you don't want, we cannot talk about it. Let's see. This is new design bounce fabric softener. It works in your dryer where it does some amazing things. It makes your clothes wonderfully soft. It eliminates static cling completely. And it makes your clothes smell fresh and beautiful. A fresh smell that lasts days longer than liquids. And it couldn't be easier. Watch. Now Bounce has a new embossed design. As the ingredients are released, the design disappears and Bounce softens, eliminates static cling, and gives clothes a long-lasting freshness. See? Design's gone. How do they do that? For long-lasting freshness, use new design Bounce, the right fabric softener. We'd like you to see for yourself how amazing Bounce really is. Just send in the label from your liquid softener, and we'll send you four sheets of new design Bounce free. You'll see it's the right fabric softener. Wow. So I do have a commercial life, as you see. <laughs> so next. All right. <laughs> Okay, so now we go back to talking about um, psychics and frauds. Okay. We are almost over, and maybe there is time for a few questions, but also we have a panel, so maybe we can also ask Randy a few questions later. Um, this is very fun to watch, of course, because this is entertainment. But there are people who are using the same um, techniques of magicians oh, yes. in a not so uh, fun way. And I'm thinking of uh, many, many examples uh, from Peter Popper, from other, which are dealing with the people's um, needs uh, yes. to get better, to heal. The emotional needs the emotional and needs physical needs. needs and physical yes. needs, exactly. Uh, what is the worst that you found in this field? The worst of all of them? Yeah. Well, Peter Popoff was one of them. And uh, I exposed him on a show that was in the United States known as the Johnny Carson showed. Johnny left us a few years ago, unfortunately. And um, I used to do that program. I did 33, I think it was, altogether appearances on that show over the years. And uh, John was, was very generous with me. He would always come to my dressing room <laughs> before the show was being taped. And he would come inside and he would, he would ask, he would say, what do you need me to mention? as something that you, you would like to have mentioned. And, and I would uh, perhaps think of something that he could mention to, to give me a, a, a beginning on a subject. And, uh, but, John smoked. Oh, hello. Uh, John smoked all the way through the show. It wasn't seen because in those days it was against the law for a person running a television show like that to actually smoke on camera. Uh, they formed a law against it, and it was very serious and very, very tight, that law.
But John would smoke. He had a secret device beneath the table, and it had a little muffin fan on it, <laughs> and it was smoking a cigarette for him. It was an automatic machine. And he would look. You would see him looking in the, the camera like this, and I would be on the other side of the camera, and back to him, and he would be looking around, trying to see when I was on camera, but his face was not. The minute that they gave him the signal that he could go for the smoke, he would lean down, take the cigarette, puff on it, and look right back, <laughs> exactly the way he was just a moment ago. He got to be very good at that. But smoking killed Johnny Carson eventually. It killed him, lung cancer, it, and it was, it was not a pleasant death, obviously. I, I lost one of my very good friends to smoking. Smoking is about the most stupid thing that human beings can do. And there are many smokers in this audience, I'm afraid. It took the lives of my parents as well. And so I'm, I'm very sensitive to that subject. It is a totally stupid thing. But in the United States, it's sold like any other merchandise. Oh, yes, commercial announcements. This is the finest tobacco you can buy. Yes, that's a fine way to die. And I, I, I hate the tobacco industry. And I think that if President Trump would ever get around to do anything useful, Perhaps he might want to do something in that direction. I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> Here's an example of how um, people preying on, um, on, uh, yes. on each other's needs take advantage. And you, on the Johnny Carson show, you showed how this was done. And we can uh, maybe see the video that yes. you tell us, OK? Yes, of course. Okay, I want to uh, point out again for the people who just might have joined us, for the people who might just have tuned in, uh, a little word of warning here. Uh, if you have a queasy stomach, the sight of blood bothers you, we suggest you don't watch this. This is James Randi, who's going to give you an idea of what the psychic surgeons in the Philippines actually do on people who go down there and pay good money. You all set? Indeed. All right, all right. we have our patient. It's all yours. Oh, okay. This is all. Well, this is the time to look away audience. if you if you need to because it's going to get a little gory from now on. The psychic surgeons of the Philippines are. Um, how are you feeling, Sandy? Okay. Everything's fine. They're pretty heartless folks. They just don't much care for the feelings of people. They don't certainly care for their health at all. And of course, they're not in any way trained to do this sort of thing. They just put on an act as if they are trained. Now, what you're about to see is a barehanded operation which appears to take place by actually penetrating the body. Believe me, what you're seeing is strictly special effects, it's sleight of hand, and nothing more. And this is the way it looks. Anything that gets down there, we don't get it on your trousers if we can help it. Uh, let me see. and worse. Wait a second now. It, ah. <laughs> oh, no, that doesn't come out.
a bonus. That's a bit better. Just a second. Just one second now. Maybe better for you. <laughs> you don't feel any better? The strange thing is, after this operation is all over, now, mind you folks, I want you to bear in mind, please, that people are showing this as if it were really serious, as if it actually did take place, and as if surgery were really performed. People do this, they go to the Philippines, they spend their money, and they frankly return home, in most cases, to die. It's a little bit funny to watch it, perhaps, and you say, gee, I know it's play acting, but it's not play acting when they go for the tens of thousands every year. Sanford, I want to thank you for being a wonderful volunteer. I think you deserve a round of applause for that. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'll get you away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, yes, you see that could look comical, it can look like fun, but tens of thousands of people still, to this very day, go to the Philippine Islands in order to have operations like that done, which are not operations, they don't puncture the skin at all. They are fake operations, and the Philippines is still full of these so-called surgeons who will do these experiments on people, and many of them return home simply to die because they weren't really operated on at all. This is a cruel, terrible, certainly illegal and immoral farce. It should be stopped. Something should be done about it. But it brings in huge income to the Philippine Islands every year. And those people are getting fat off the ignorance of the people who lay on the table. Yes, we are now getting to the end of this uh, conversation, and then we're going to have a panel, but first we have uh, something else. Claire, right? Uh, do you have a bit of advice from your long career and your experience to give to other skeptics that are here listening to you? Well, I'm very proud to be called to talk to a group like this of skeptical people. Very proud and rather humbled by the fact that she would come and sit in a theater like this for this long period of time to hear what I have to say. The work you do is important as skeptics. It's important, please continue it, because each and every one of you has the potential of saving someone from making a wrong decision somewhere along the line. Those wrong decisions could cost people's lives. I urge you all, work hard at it. Make your feelings known. Write articles on it in your own language and make sure that they get circulated. Appear on television at every opportunity if you think you have something valuable to say that will be effective and will affect people's way of thinking. The work that you can do in this regard is extremely important, ladies and gentlemen, and there may be people sitting right here before me, I suspect there are people sitting here who can do the same kind of thing or just a mere appearance and a lecture to people who may fall for these charlatans. They're criminals, in my estimation. I know they're fakes, and I think we all know that they are fakes. Miracles like this, like what you saw me demonstrate there, they don't happen, they're fake. And I had the great opportunity during my lifetime to appear many, many times on television in this country and all over the world. That was a great privilege. And I thank you for granting me that privilege and for being my audience today. Thank you, each and every one of you. James Randall.
Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you.